Okay, so 6.05, and I think I'm going to get started here. So let's talk about um, let's talk about screening and uh, and diagnostics. Okay? So we have the grand total of one slide on this. Um, so screening and diagnostics. So let's just quickly kind of review our healthcare system, which is sort of a house of cards. So on the top of the healthcare system, we have reimbursement. So for those of you who may not be familiar, reimbursement refers to the means by which healthcare providers get paid. In order to get paid, there needs to be a reimbursement code. If there's no reimbursement code, we have trouble. Okay, so, so reimbursement then refers to the process of payment for, for products, services, and, and the time of healthcare professionals. So, so when we're talking about a patient's journey through the healthcare system, um, reimbursement, of course, assumes that the patients have been treated correctly. So private payers, public payers, um, insurance companies, they're not willing to pay unless the appropriate treatment has been used. And of course, all of this presupposes that the patient has a correct diagnosis, okay? What's not part of the pyramid is screening. So, so what I wanna convey here is the fundamental difference that I describe for students is the difference between screening and diagnosis. Now, this is the description I use. The FDA does not describe it in these terms, but in my experience to date, everything I'm a, what I'm about to tell you is going to be helpful for you 99.9% .9 of the time. So here's the distinction I make. When you screen somebody with any kind of tool, there's only one result that can ever happen. If you screen somebody with a medical tool of any kind, the only result that can happen is you're going to refer to that patient for additional follow-up. You're going to refer to that patient to a proper healthcare professional you're gonna to refer to that patient for proper diagnostic workup. So the only result that can occur from screening is additional follow-up. Diagnosis is different. What flows from diagnosis is treat, are treatment outcomes. Okay? So a treatment outcome can only come from a diagnostic decision. A treatment decision cannot come from a screening decision. Okay? So in terms of screening tools then used in our, in our healthcare system, they can afford to have high sensitivity. They can afford to have false positives um, because nobody's making a treatment decision based on a screening result. So good operational definition. We're covering this for a reason. Uh, it'll be clear later. Okay. So, so, well, let me say now, actually. So a common, um, a common problem that's occurring in the digital health space right now uh, and to lesser extent, other medical devices, is that a lot of startup companies try to position their product idea as a new diagnostic tool. And the, and the burden of evidence for a new diagnostic tool is going to be extremely high. We're not going to go into it, but it's going to be extremely high. So, so oftentimes, it's better to position your new technology as a screening tool. It's going to be lower risk. The burden of cl clinical evidence will be much lower. So you present it as a screening tool, and um, and 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 that way you're going to be have much greater likelihood of approval by the FDA. And if you want to go for a diagnostic uh, indication, you can do that down the road in the future when you have more money and can conduct uh, better testing uh, that's more robust. Okay, so so see strategically then there's an important difference between screening and diagnostics. Screening is a lower risk. Uh, uh, intended use of a device than, diagno than diagnosis. Okay, so talk about screening diagnosis, done. So now we're gonna talk about digital health. This will take about two slides. Uh, so digital health. So the primary distinction, uh, here's a primary distinction I wanna make here is health. So the terminology, okay. In a regulatory context, Health is not what you think it is. In a regulatory context, health is not what you think it is. Okay. So we have, in a regulatory context, we have a fundamental distinction between health and medical products. Okay. Medical products are regulated by Health Canada. They're regulated by the FDA. They're regulated, obviously, by, you know, um, a medical authority. This can get a little confusing. Like, the regulatory body in Canada is called Health Canada, but Health Canada regulates medical products. 
the FDA regulates medical products. Health products, by definition, are not regulated by the FDA. They are not regulated by Health Canada. Okay? So a health product is, enjoys just as much regulation as the scotch tape and the scissors you get from Canadian Tire or the candy you might buy from a store. It has no special status, no special oversight. Okay? So let's go through a couple of examples then. On the left are health products, not regulated by Health Canada, not regulated by the FDA. On the right are medical products. They are regulated by Health Canada. They are regulated by the FDA. So relaxation and stress management, sleep management, improved sexual function. Heart rate monitor, right? That's going to depend, right? If you're using a heart rate monitor in a high-risk population, that'll be regulated as a medical product. If you're using it in the general population, then it'll be regulated as a health and wellness product. And this all comes back to hazard analysis and risk. Okay. So all of these things are low risk. The heart rate monitor could become high risk if you're exclusively targeting high risk patients. Now let's talk about medical products. So in a way, this is pretty straightforward, but then it gets tricky. So any treat to claim to treat or diagnose will make something a medical product. Okay, we get that. Okay. Restoring structure or function. Okay, that pretty much goes without saying. Uh, something is a medical product if as an accessory, it's exclusive and proprietary to the medical device in question. But here's where we get into trouble. Right here. Okay. Now listen, it is what it is. I have an entire lecture just on this <laughs> one bullet point, but, but it is what it is. So the mitigation or prevention of disease. Okay. Arguably, the shirt I'm wearing right now could be a medical product, right? Because it's helping me with thermal regulation, which allows me to avoid hypothermia. And if I have hypothermia, that can lead to, that's obviously a clinical condition. So mitigation or prevention of disease exists on a continuum. This is not a categorical variable. And how do you sort this out? You're going to have to use hazard analysis. So we're not getting into that tonight. Okay. So so let's keep in mind then that medical products have an area of ambiguity that is a continuum of risk. And the continuum of risk, if you will, is the mitigation or prevention of disease. All right. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of just kind of summarize this flow chart, uh, but this, I, I think these, these, I'm showing a couple of flow charts that come from guidance documents. I think they're overkill but I know that some students are more comfortable with flow charts than anything else, okay? So I put the uh, reference down here as well for where, which the guidance document in question, where this flow chart has come from. So let me just summarize this. Uh, let me just summarize this if I may. Uh, when it comes to software regulation, the rules are slightly different than for regulation of medical devices in general. Software, so SAMD, I don't like the acronym, but SAMD is software as a medical device. Okay, So when software becomes a medical device, it's regulated by Health Canada. It's regulated by the FDA. So software as a medical device, what happens when you use 510K for modification to an FDA approved medical app? So it works slightly differently here. Um, um, the the primary responsibility of the FDA is to protect public, public safety. It's not the responsibility of the FDA to promote innovation, but certainly the FDA wants to appear to be friendly and supportive of innovation, but let's not forget their primary responsibility is protecting public safety. It's not helping startup, startup companies. All right, so the, uh, the main issue here is, is that the companies are given more responsibility and power here. It, it, so with, with normal medical devices, let's go way back here. With, no, with a traditional medical device, any kind of change you make to a medical device, you're going to have to submit a 510K or PMA. So you make any change to a medical device, you have to submit a 510K or PMA. But down here, when we get into software, it's a little bit different. Um, the manufacturer can decide, has been given the discretion and responsibility and the power to decide whether or not the change is minor or, or, or major. 
If the change is a very minor change, the manufacturer won't even submit a 510K. If the change is kind of, kind of a bigger change, then at the manufacturer's discretion, they can decide to submit uh, a 510K. Okay, so, so it's a little bit different here. Okay, so again, coming back up here with traditional medical devices, you make a change to your device, you're going to submit a 510K if you're a 510K approved to begin with. Uh, but down here, when it comes to software, just because you change your software doesn't mean you need to submit a 510K. Uh, so the manufacturer then is allowed to make the judgment call about when it is time for them to submit a 510K. All right, that, ladies and gentlemen, is a digital health regulation and the grand total of two slides. <laughs> uh, on, to our, on, to our, on to the topic we actually wanted to talk about tonight, because we're going to need the elements that we've reviewed. Artificial intelligence regulation. Yep, Sankita. So as you mentioned, if there are minor changes in software, it's the manufacturer has to decide. Um, so if there are minor changes and they don't uh, uh, send it to 510K, but it's still they have a qualification like validation and studies, um, does it necessary to have operational qualification and installation qualification of that software after any changes, even if we don't go to 510K? I can't, I, if I understand your question, question correctly, I can't comment on that. Uh, I mean, there are, you know, there are general controls in place that, that you have to meet, but my understanding it, it would be that in terms of general controls, in terms of like manufacturing practices and safety reporting, the, the manufacturer, of course, has to live up to and enforce the general controls that are part of being registered as a medical device. Okay? So if I understand your question, the manufacturer still has to comply with measures for, for general controls. Okay. Uh, excuse me, can you just go over the previous slide very briefly? I'm sorry, I didn't get. Yeah, I'm, uh, uh, so sir, sir uh, uh, certainly. So, so just to kind of summarize how this, how this is kind of working. Um, if we talk about a, medical device that is hardware or a combination of hardware and software. Any change that you make to a medical device requires a regulatory submission. So a class two or class three, any change to a class two or class three requires a regulatory submission. Class two products, if you change them in any way, are going to require some kind of regulatory submission at the very least of 510K. Okay. When it comes to software though, there's a difference. Uh, and currently the way the FDA is working with software is, is that if you make very minor, very minor modifications to software, you don't need to make a regulatory submission. It's only when you make bigger changes to software, I'm not saying major, but bigger changes to software, if the manufacturer thinks that these changes are big enough to warrant a 510K, then they can submit it. So if I can try and summarize again, traditional medical devices always have to submit a 510K in modifying a class two product, regardless how small the change is. On the other hand, when it comes to software, the manufacturer can choose. If the manufacturer makes a very small change to software, they don't need to make a regulatory submission. But if they make what they deem to be a sufficiently large change to software, then the man it's the manufacturer's responsibility to decide when they have to submit a new 510K to describe their fi their software change to the FDA. Does that make uh, sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I'll tell you something. I mean, kind of the joke I kind of like to make is I envy, I envy my students because my students will learn this stuff across several lectures, right? It took me years to sort this out. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I used to work in investment banking. Uh, I used to identify startups for uh, investment in biotechnology. And, and it was always bewildering medical device regulation because every time you thought you knew the rules, you encounter an exception. And so that's what makes device regulation so challenging is there are a lot of exceptions, which we're not going into tonight, but there are a lot of exceptions. And, and so it makes it hard to come up with a coherent framework over time. And uh, and just going to the chat channel and Zoom uh, to Savina's uh, comment, uh, um, there is no go-to manual on this. Um, you know, I, I've sent out a book chapter that I think Ahmed will share with the the class, but 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 beyond that, 
you know, the review articles you'll find online are going to provide less depth on the topic. And really, you're only left then. Your only option is go to the FDA guidance documents to sort this out. Uh, you're muted there, Dan. Uh, go ahead. I just had a quick question. So wouldn't you submit a special 510K for a small software change? Uh, currently, it doesn't look like that's currently it doesn't look like they're requiring requiring that. So if you're making a very small change, the manufacturer can decide to make no submission whatsoever. OK. And would that be something like a letter to file? I can't comment on that. I, I'm not sure about that. All I can say is I don't think any notification of the uh, of the FDA is, is warranted. If they make a somewhat larger change, then they can consider these other types of submissions. But but if the manufacturer deems it to be a very minor change to the software, the FDA is not requiring any notification. Okay, thank you. Okay, cheers. Okay, so um, let's talk about, uh, let's have a little chat then about artificial intelligence and, and where we're going. So, a look, I mean, some of you are going to have a lot of background in this, and some of you may not. So, just to kind of orient our, our terminology, um, everybody seems to talk about artificial intelligence. I get it. Um, but if you actually look at the definition for artificial intelligence, it's, it includes a lot of things that we may not consider AI. So, the broad definition of artificial intelligence would also include if then statements, pre scripted responses that and linear regression. I mean, all of those things would be considered AI. So the actual kind of formal use of the term artificial intelligence is actually sufficiently broad to maybe not, maybe not be that meaningful to many of us. Uh, so within the, the, the broad umbrella of artificial intelligence, we have machine learning, which specifically talks about statistical tools um, um, that, that would that not only be artificial intelligence, but would be machine learning. So classic examples of this, of course, would be linear regression, multiple regression, and maybe Markov chains. I think there's some debate about whether or not Markov chains are an example of machine learning or not. And then, and then as a subset then of machine learning, we get into deep learning, which is the use of neural networks to interrogate large data sets. So just kind of right now in kind of our, our technology culture, a lot of times when people are talking about artificial intelligence, they're really talking about deep learning. But, you know, as I understand it from our, our statistical colleagues, that's not really the nomenclature. Uh, artificial intelligence is not synonymous with deep learning. It, it is a broader category. Again, this is a pretty astute audience, but I just thought I'd go over this anyway, okay? So, um, so when we're talking about um, you know, training a neural network uh, you know, to, to perform a classification task, a diagnostic uh, a task, for example. So we have a training set with a set of images that we all agree uh, in terms of expert human reviewers that in this case, we're looking at histology that let's just say could be indicative of cancer. So the training set might include some normal histology and let's just say some histology that is cancerous. And so we would train the neural network up on that until it reaches a certain performance level. And then of course, then we test it on a new training set, or sorry, a new test set. So this test set would have a set of images that were never part of the training set. And um, once the neural network has been sufficiently trained and is operating at a performance level that is acceptable, uh, then we would submit it for you know, FDA approval. And the FDA approval, um, there would be a disclosure of the algorithm or disclosure of the training and the performance score for, say, a neural network. And once we do that, once we submit to the FDA, this neural network is going to be locked. It's not going to be allowed to undergo any further training after this point. So it'll be deployed on the market. And you know, this neural network will do its best job to perform the classification functions it was allowed to do. But once it's deployed in the market, it does not learn, okay? So it's a locked neural network. It cannot learn any further beyond the original training set. And this is our current paradigm then for medical device regulation with artificial intelligence. And let's just see. Um, uh, I, I thought, you know, just kind of a, we're going to talk about two product examples tonight, just kind of briefly, and uh, let's just see if this one will play. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, gastro gastroendoscopy. So we're exploring the colon uh, with a camera and here the gastroenterologist 
is being assisted through a detection tool through artificial intelligence for lesions and abnormalities in the colon. So let's just have a look at this briefly. Okay, so I think you get the idea. So typically right now, a way a lot of these, a lot of um, systems using artificial intelligence are being approved. They're being approved either as a 510K or a de novo submission. Okay. Now we haven't talked much, we haven't really talked about tonight uh, about clinical evidence and what's required, but the de novo submissions being used actually have significant clinical data. Um, they could have in some cases up to 700 patients of clinical data for a de novo submission. That's a lot, okay? So, so that's good to see. Um, it's also good to see there's a lot more disclosure around the testing for um, uh, devices that are using uh, artificial intelligence, in this case, for you know, lesion or abnormality detection. So let's come to what we really wanna talk, to, uh, talk about tonight is unlocked uh, neural networks, or you know, we could say unlocked machine learning, but I think unlocked neural networks is more appropriate. What if we approved, or the FDA approved, a neural network that was capable of learning after FDA approval? Okay. So I I like making predictions, and I don't know if Ahmed, you remember my latest prediction, but I predicted back in 2019 we'd be, or 2020 we'd be stuck with COVID until 2023, and. Um, that was my prediction back then for that. So I have fun with this. It comes back from my investment banking days. Um, so here's my prediction. In the next five years, we are going to see an unlocked neural network approved as a medical device. Okay? This is, we're going to cross a Rubicon here in, the, in our healthcare system when this happens. And I think we're close to seeing this take place. So the starting point for our discussion, and you know the citation is there. Um, this is not a guidance document. The FDA has not issued a guidance document on this yet because they have not sufficient, sufficiently formulated their thinking on this topic. Uh, and so for those of you who are interested, the FDA is very interested in hearing back from researchers and, and private sector on, on how to shape regulation in this area. So this is their document here. Um, and uh, so it's available. You can look it up. Um, it, it is not an official document. It simply represents the FDA's current thoughts on this matter. So let's talk about how an unlocked neural network would, would, would its basic characteristics. So we have our training set or test set, as we said before, but now it's unlocked. So when it's put on the market, it can continue to learn. Okay. So we're talking about real-time changes in our neural network that can change its clinical decision making, um, and and over time, you know, it could change its intended use, the kinds of patients that it's prepared to deal with. It could also change the kind of inputs it's working with, and its performance may change. So as you might imagine, these are major areas of uncertainty for something that's going to be released on the market that will change. Uh, Dion. Uh, so what regulatory documentation is kind of is recommended for these changes right now? Uh, supposing there is a, I mean, for example, there's a de novo and, and it wouldn't follow the normal path, right? I mean, well, what right, do you think? Well, right now there's zero, like there's no right on this topic right here, there's zero. So, so we can only do two things. We can extrapolate from how the FDA has managed. Sorry, guys, can you mute yourself, please? We're getting background noise on the call. Okay, so 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 two things. The first thing we can do is we can go to the current document, which represents the FDA's current thinking on this topic. The only and otherwise there's no guidance documents. The only other thing we can do is we can extrapolate from uh, the regulation of other products. The problem with extrapolating with regulation with other products is this is a step function. In, in, in the kind of product the FDA regulates. Let's put it this way, that we are at the point right now, like there was a time, you guys are much younger than me, I'm 56, but there used to be a time 
when there was no such thing as apps and there was no such thing as a medical app. So, so it was very, very novel and exciting to see the FDA approve the first medical app for the first time because there had never been such a thing as a medical app before. This is going to be a more dramatic change. And because this is going to be a dramatic change, we don't have a lot of precedent here to work with. But there are a few things we can look at. And I'll, 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 So what are the things we can look at? One of the things we can look at uh, for precedent is medical imaging. So we can have a look at current regulatory practices for the FDA for uh, the use of artificial intelligence and medical imaging. And we'll touch on an example of that shortly. But otherwise, this is new ground. There's not a whole lot we can extrapolate from, and we're going to have to think from the ground up how we want to approach this. And that's why at the start of this lecture and everything I teach on this topic, it all comes down to one thing, risk. Okay. So that's kind of a big non-answer to your question, but is that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. It just raises so many questions with, as to what's going to happen now post this. Oh yeah, we don't know, right? This all yeah, has to be sorted yeah. out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, well, I, so I'm going to put my own views out on this. I, I plan to put out a position paper on this probably in the next 18 months or so, but, but, um, but uh, I'm not there yet. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the FDA's current thoughts are and what my current thoughts are on, on the topic. So, um, there is an additional. There is an additional framework we can use for risk stratification of, of um, software with respect to the decisions it makes. So this comes for, um, from a different organization uh, outside the FDA, an internationally recognized organization for software as a medical device. So we can talk about the uh, uh, state of the healthcare uh, condition, you know, critical, serious, non-serious, and then we can begin to stratify by now, this is not the same risk class necessarily as what we talked about before, but this is still a stratification of risk. And so we can stratify the relative risk of clinical decision making for each of these contexts treatment or diagnosis, drive clinical management, or informed clinical management. And clearly, you know, uh, clinical decision making by software is going to represent higher risk when it's talking about treatment or diagnosis, uh, lower risk when it's driving clinical management and much lower risk when it's informing clinical management. Informed clinical management, I would rephrase and say this is a screening function. Okay, so we talked about the difference between screening and diagnosis. This is basically a screening function. So, so what the FDA has talked about is an, what they call a, an algorithm change protocol. So, Let's talk about the challenge that the algorithm change protocol is intended to try and manage here. So we have, we have our, let's start with FDA approval. So we have our FDA approval of a neural network that was previously trained on a bunch of medical images. I don't know, stroke detection or, you know, identifying aneurysms, whatever it may be. So we have a training set and this is, uh, this neural network has been trained with this training set and it's FDA approved. Now, in a non-lock scenario, what's going to happen? Well, you know, this is partly the FDA and, and partly me, but what's going to happen? So we have, over time, we're going to, have to be looking at training set expansion because if the neural network is going to learn, it's going to have to expand its original training set or, or change it in some way. So one thing we could see then is we could see additional examples of patients added to the original training set over time. And this would, of course, expand the sample size of the neural network and in theory, improve its clinical decision making. So this is all good. But over time, this is the issue that needs to be managed that is a major concern. Down below, I have an unusual patient. Is it an outlier? Or does it simply represent kind of an additional example of the disease phenotype that should be added to the training set? So over time, these unusual patients are going to be added to our, our original training set. So the question is, what kind of gatekeeper function should we have here? What are the determinants when a sufficiently unusual patient should be added to the training set? We want to be careful not to add outliers, but on the other hand, we'll never achieve new learning 
unless we kind of adequately represent the disease pathology as it exists in the actual population in question. So the algorithm change protocol is struggling with this very issue. The algorithm change protocol is all about how to manage these changes over time. Yes, we want the neural network to learn, but no, we don't want it to become diluted and dysfunctional. So how do we make this work in practical terms? So I'm just gonna use the term, I'm gonna identify this as training set drift, okay? So this is the issue, and I'm borrowing from population genetics when I, when I make this allusion. So, so, and there's, it is also parallel with medical device regulation we didn't have time to get into tonight. So training set drift, and I think that's the thing we need to be concerned about. This is antithetical to learning. Our choice is either learning or drift, okay? And if we have drift, we're gonna have a decrease in performance, a decrease in accuracy of the clinical decision tool or classifier uh, in question. So just to expand on the prior slide. Okay. So these would be my key concerns that kind of go beyond the, the uh, FDA document in question. How exactly are we gonna trigger an update? You know, what exactly are the gatekeeper functions that will allow us to expand the, uh, the training set in question? Because this is critical, right? So how will the training set be updated? Okay. So when will we trigger it and when will we allow an update? Because this is an issue because, uh, yeah. you know, it's all fine and well to say, you know, we'll expand the training set whenever we find a reasonable patient. Yeah, but, but if you end up with a training set, let's just say with 10,000 patients, you've now forfeited the option of bringing in a human expert to verify the, the existing training set. So we have to keep this scalable and retain the option of a human expert to come in and verify additions to the training set. If it's not just a question of whether or not, it's not just a question about whether or not we add the wrong type of patient. That's not the only issue here. The other issue is this. If we just allow the training set to expand and expand with legitimate patients who have been added, it's going to make it harder and harder to verify the contents of the training set because we're going to have to use a human observer. We can't use, we can't automate this by definition. We're trying to use a human expert or a truther to check on the automation. We can't use automation to check on automation. All right. Uh, and this has a direct parallel with a medical device issue we didn't get into tonight. Um, so I can't use it as an example, but, but a question we're gonna have to ask ourselves is, is as the neural network begins to evolve over time with the addition of additional patients, how far this training set can depart from the original training set. So how far can the updated training set depart from the training set that was originally FDA approved? Okay. So this, this last point here, or second last point, comes to some of the issues. Uh, we want a periodic best practices check. So a truther, I don't like the term, but that's a term that's being used. So an expert in the anatomy in question or in the, in the, in the case in question. But going back to my point, it has to be scalable. And we're not bringing in a human expert to check 10,000 cases. But now the FDA document doesn't talk about this explicitly, but they never do anyway. Um, whatever it is we do, ladies and gentlemen, absolutely, the algorithm change protocol has to be subject to a hazard analysis. So we're going to have a hazard analysis on the device. We're going to have a hazard analysis on the software or the neural network but we're gonna also have to have a separate hazard analysis on the algorithm change protocol. And we've never done anything like that before. And all of this is gonna be aggregated into a single risk score. We're not gonna get into some of these acronyms, um, but, but I'm gonna kind of, again, summarize kind of the thinking, if you will, from the, the document on this point. Um, the current thinking is the FDA seems to be articulating, and I could be wrong in this point, they've taken the flexibility that we discussed with software a, a further step. Okay. So what they're saying here is the following. The neural network would only have to undergo a regulatory submission if there was a dramatic change, such as a change in intended use. Otherwise, if the neural network requires a 510K submission, you don't even need to do that. It's only if the 510K submission in question 
involves certain categories of change, one of which would be intended use. Okay. So that's a further evolution of this thinking. I'm not happy with this. I think this is the wrong way to go because of this. There are plenty of discussions we can have about when intended use is changing or not and how much clinical risk is involved. You can't leave it to a neural network. You can't leave it to a neural network, even for a company necessarily to make this assessment. That this is not the kind of assessment we should be leaving to private sector. And it's certainly not the kind of assessment we wanna to leave to a neural network. It, it, so it introduces a lot of risk and uncertainty, I would argue, to allow a neural network to change its intended use because we don't know which way is this going to go. Um, so if a neural network is allowed to change its intended use over time without proper submissions, we can introduce major, major risk here. Okay? So for those of you who might have heard the phrase, Jesse Galsinger, that's the, uh, the young man who was killed in a phase one trial of the first gene therapy. And as a result of that single death, which was high profile, um, gene therapy has been dead for several decades and has only recently started to make a comeback. We don't want to make the same mistake uh, with neural networks. And my concern here is, is that if I'm, I'm, I support going unlocked, I think we can do it, but that's not going to happen by giving manufacturers of neural networks this kind of latitude. This is too much. So we're gonna, I would argue we're going to have to manage this differently. So, so, um, so what can we do here and what would be permissible? Uh, we need to go the opposite direction. You, so rather than talking about expanding the indication, expanding the intended use, to heck with that. Let's go the reverse direction. Let's talk about optimization. So let's use an example, say, from uh, gastro, gastro, uh, gastroenterology. You know, you, let's just say the, the, the AI system is doing a workup on um, a gastroenterology patients. Let's just say. So the device in question may be working for patients with Crohn's disease, but it could optimize. So it could say, well, you know, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to start identifying segments, no pun intended, segments of the disease, such as uh, Crohn's disease patients with only small bowel involvement, small, Crohn's disease patients with only ileal involvement, Crohn's disease patients with only um, large bowel involvement. So I think this is the direction to go. If we're going to have changes in intended use, let's talk about optimization and segmentation. And let's not talk about allowing this, allowing a neural network to expand its intended use. Instead, let's allow it to have the opportunity to uh, specialize and segment the patient population. Okay. Don't be wrong, um, this will still offer, still carry some safety risks. And that, again, has to be all subject to hazard analysis. But it's a much better starting point than allowing an, an unlocked system to expand its intended use. Uh, now let's talk about state of the art. I can see what the way we're going tonight. We're not gonna have uh, time for, I don't think class exercise on it. Just, it is what it is because we're covering a lot here. We'll see. So, so, so let's just talk about where we are currently. So the IDX, are, the IDX DR system is one of several recent uh, approvals in, uh, the use of uh, artificial intelligence vis-a-vis -vis, uh, something like a neural network, in this case for diabetic neuropathy. So the original IDXR system was approved by de novo pathway. And I'm glad to see two things. One, de novo and 510K submissions usually don't have a lot of clinical data. These submissions have a lot. So that's great to see. I'm really encouraged by that. And two, there's a lot of disclosure, which I know may seem strange to you, but when it comes to medical device submissions, there's not a lot of disclosure. It's not a perfect world. <laughs> we could talk about that in a social setting. Uh, medical device disclosure is nowhere near what it is drugs. Drugs represent the gold standard and the ideal. Medical devices have far less disclosure. All right, so good to see a lot of disclosure here. Good to see sample sizes. Good to see clinical data. I'm encouraged, okay? So the IDXDR was approved for diabetic neuropathy. And then that was then, as you guys identified in our earlier exercise, that was used as a predicate to generally use a 510K pathway to have a second generation device called the iART. Okay. Uh, if you're interested in this, you can here's a clinical trial uh, identifier. That's a, for those of you who may not be familiar, 
the NCT numbers are, that's your serial number for the clinical trial in question. You can look that right up in clinicaltrial.gov. Now, this is, now let's just finish our, our description here. This is, this has some special controls on to reduce the risk. Supposedly, this is autonomous uh, approval of artificial intelligence, but it's not really autonomous. So we have the patient, we uh, have the healthcare provider is not necessarily going to be an expert in the discipline in question. And, uh, and this, the data would be sent to eventually to an expert system or a neural network where, you know, it would undergo image analysis. So this would be in a, in a remote setting. So this is a class two device that, that uses a, you know, it uses AI for the purposes we just described. Now I'm, I'm par I'm taking this point from the, uh, the product label here. This is the part of the reason we can get away with this being the, well, the reason we, in my opinion, we're getting away with this being autonomous AI is because of this. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a screening tool. So any uh, positive identifications of abnormalities in this assessment for diabetic uh, retinopathy are subject to follow up with a human expert. So yes, it's autonomous, but it's autonomous for screening. And, and that comes back to our earlier point where a screening function carries less risk, all other things being equal, than a diagnostic uh, intended use. I, I don't think we're going to have enough time for this tonight, um, you know, but this, uh, we've covered a lot. So I just kind of kind of wrap up a little bit here. So I'll talk to you about what I was thinking, because this may be food for thought for you guys to think about, okay? So here is what I, I see is sort of the relatively distant goal for unlocked neural networks. When I say distant goal, I'm talking about possibly 15 years in the future, okay? It could be 15, 20 years in the future, but this is the distant goal. Here we go. A data pool, okay? Draws from the, the neural network is able to draw from the patient population and patient history in making a decision to optimize treatment and add an additional intended use. Uh, drift control, okay? So we talked about concerns about drift and the algorithm change protocol. So the, uh, the algorithm change protocol will have to use a periodic classifier challenge versus a truth standard, right? You're gonna need some sort of reference standard there. Um, so the truth standard is, is going to have to involve human expert involvement. That doesn't change. I think we're going to still need that in, in, the, in the distant future. The challenge will be to make this scalable and practical and feasible and executable. Um, no clinician wants to be hired to review 10,000 images. Okay, so, so it's getting there. Um, that will be the trick, but that's the outcome. Uh, human expert intervention. Okay, so we're, we're going to need to contemplate the precise circumstances where we're going to have truthing in order to keep this scalable and manageable. And so um, what I would suggest here is in the, well, what I see in the future is um, anytime we see a trend, a downward trend in performance of the neural network in question, it's learning in real time. We do period, we do regular assessments. And when we do those regular assessments, if we see a downward trend in performance, then then that's time to bring on board human expert intervention as truthers to review the training set that's been accumulated to date by focusing on recent additions to the training set. Uh, to the extent I, I understand this, the, the must, so, so I mean, I have sort of a, I have sort of a rule here that might be disappointing. My rule professionally is the following. I only talk about products that exist. I don't talk about products in development, okay? And, and the reason I do that is, 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 in my opinion, a service to my students. Because um, back in my investment banking days where I was responsible for investing in a lot of high-risk technologies, um, I have uh, garnered um, a deep appreciation, no pun on deep, I, I have a good appreciation for how often technologies fail and go nowhere, okay? So, so in terms of trying to keep things practical for the students, I only talk about technologies that are actionable today and can actually happen. Um, and the reason we're talking about unlock tonight is because 
this is part of forecasting. I think this is going to happen very soon. So, so in terms of things like Neuralink and the and the uh, the Musk chip, I don't have much to say for now because it's not on my radar. It's not a reality yet to me. But uh, but it's interesting. Uh, intended use. So it would be diagnostic without clinical oversight. This is where we want to go. Uh, a good so when we talk about diagnostic without clinical oversight, the choice of indication is really important. So I cannot think possibly, of the, I mean, what are the worst possible examples here in terms of risk? Septic shock and probably stroke, maybe heart attack. Heart attack, stroke, and septic shock, right? So high mortality risk. Um, the time interval for clinical intervention is, is very short. We're talking about hours or days. Boundaries. Okay? So no boundaries on the neural network. It can change its intended use. Okay? So this AI goal, is a goal that is, for all intents and purposes, not practical. I, this could happen in maybe 15, 20 years. So what's our challenge then? Because this is not our point of discussion. Our challenge is to work backwards. And the question we need to think about is this. And, and this is a challenge I just ran for my biomedical engineers at the downtown campus. And it's something I'm beginning to discuss with my digital health technology students at the University of Toronto Mississauga campus. We have a professional master's program. And the question we want to start wrestling with is this, what will the first generation of unlocked AI look like? Because that is what I see coming in the next five years. So this goal state that I just described, that's not happening in any, in any practical time frame. like that's way off into the future, you know, so that's a long way off. But the reason I have articulated it is I think it's helpful to reverse engineer here the regulatory trajectory to bring us to that point. So we need to start thinking about what the second generation unlocked neural network would be to bring us to that point, which would then help us to think about what would be the first generation of, a, of an unlocked neural network to bring us to that point. Okay. So we, we don't really have time for class exercise tonight uh, for our second part here, but I would just, so, I'll just give you some of, my, some of my quick thoughts on this. Let's come back here. So what would the first generation look like? I'm still thinking this through, but this is what I'm thinking. <laughs> um, I think the lowest risk application of unlocked near AI is to give it freedom and flexibility to draw from patient history. Okay. Uh, drawing from uh, a population of data increases the risk substantially. So I think Probably, and I'm still thinking about this, but the first generation of unlocked AI will be restricted to the patient history for the specific subject in question, which raises another issue that's that is a polemic we can't even get into tonight, and that is how do you analyze several million data points from the same subjects? Traditional statistical analysis won't allow you to do that. So, uh, in the context of wearable technology, people are looking at new paradigms for the analysis of data. Second, so how do we man how, how are we going to manage drift? And for drift, I would say, kind of what I mentioned earlier, you do not expand or add to the intended use. The only thing you can do is optimize and segment your existing indication. So again, that's what I would argue would be the, the lowest risk version of the first unlocked AI system that we could have for approval. Um, human expert intervention, that's key, but that flows from design elements. We all recognize we need this. That's not the question. The question is we have to keep it manageable and feasible. So the key thing here is scalable. Okay? So uh, I'm still kind of wrestling with this and how to kind of keep this scalable so that it is practical and feasible to have a human expert come in. Intended use. This would be the worst possible application. We want an indication relatively of low clinical risk where decision-making is spread out over time. So probably, uh, you know, as I still think about this, for the first generation of an unlocked AI, we want to see something that is uh, involved in clinical decision-making for a chronic condition over time. What we do not want is something that is involved in clinical decision-making that's high risk, that's acute, because that's, that's the worst possible mix of parameters in terms of generating risks. Boundaries, and I, and I kind of goes back to what I mentioned before. The boundaries here would be very strict. 
Intended use cannot change, but the uh, neural network can choose to segment and subclassify uh, patients uh, with respect to the, the therapeutic in question. So, you know, I think about this over time on the X axes and on the Y axes, our increasing risk. Uh, our submissions could be PMA or they could be de novo. Okay. Um, I, I don't think it's, you know, the choice between 510K and, and PMA, probably we want to be operating in the 510K space. Uh, the mistake we don't want to make, and, and my biomedical engineers wrestled with this just recently, you don't solve the problem by simply saying, look, at, I'm going to do an unlocked neural network. And oh, and by the way, I'm going to submit a PMA. Are we happy? The FDA is not going to be happy. Just because PMA is the most expensive high-risk pathway to go through the PMA does not mean the FDA would feel sufficiently comfortable right now with an unlocked neural network submission for them to even approve this. Which I think brings me to my, I think my last point about this here uh, is, is the first system has to be a screening function. It cannot be diagnostic. Okay? It has to be a screening function. Um, so whatever we do with unlocked neural networks, it has to be for screening purposes. That's going to pose a commercial challenge because companies in private sector, they're not happy, generally speaking, with screening applications and nor investors. Why? Because it's just not that lucrative. So, but from a regulatory perspective, we have to find the intersection. So, but from a regulatory perspective, these first systems, they have to be screening in nature. They cannot be, for the most part, they cannot be diagnostic. And when I say diagnostic, and I think this is my last point, when I say diagnostic, and I should probably like for example, if you consider a glucose meter, a closed loop glucose meter, which decides to uh, inject insulin into a patient um, or uh, an implantable cardioverter defibrillator, which decides to, to stimulate the heart to restore normal cardiac rhythm. These are not diagnostic, but, but they are making decisions which impact the patients. So these are not screening functions. Okay? So I think we're going to have to kind of, kind of um, expand our concept of diagnosis and and it's either we have to avoid in the first generation of this product iteration, it cannot be diagnostic and it cannot be making clinical decisions autonomously. Well, folks, uh, you know, Ahmed and I have discussed at length uh, the, the, the challenges of online delivery, but, um, uh, but I always appreciate uh, Ahmed's invitation uh, when, he con when we talk about what's going on with the Medventions program at Sunnybrook Hospital. I, I, Sunnybrook Hospital occupies a special place in my heart uh, for a lot of professional reasons as well. I think it's a fantastic hospital. And uh, so thanks for so much for your, your, your invitation tonight, Ahmed. And for the rest of you, if you have any additional questions you want to talk about this, you know, here's my contact information. But otherwise, uh, thanks so much.